This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 166, recorded on January 13th, 2012. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the weekly discussion and conversation about viruses. It is Friday the 13th, so hopefully everything will work. Joining me today here in TWIV studio, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Can you be more enthusiastic? Hello, Vincent! There you go. Good to see you. <laughs> That's good to be seen. <laughs> Welcome back to TWIV. Thank you, sir. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. Hi, Dixon. Hello, Richard. How you doing? I'm doing well. Vincent is doing great. Good. Am I enthusiastic enough? It's beautiful. (laughs) Love it. Good. But you're always like that. Yeah. Dixon tends to start off, you know, a little muted. I don't know. And that messes with the levels. (laughs) Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Well, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Marvelous. All right. Good. Once I was a chair of a study section, and a grant came up where I had to leave the room. Right? Cause it's it was that my, bad. It was, from, <laughs> no. it, was from, it was a conflict. So I said to them, don't take too long, please. So I went out. In five minutes, they were done, and someone said, Hey, Vince, when you say jump, we say how high. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's the only so. time that ever happened in my life, and now it happened today. Everybody's enthusiastic. Exactly. There you go. Absolutely. Go. Today, we are packed full of virology. Bring it on. But first, here in New York City, I have to tell everyone, it is not only f- one degree, but the winds are gusting up to 50 miles per hour. Right. Mm-hmm. Is it like that in Massachusetts, Alan? Uh, it's not quite that bad. You, one degree Fahrenheit? Centigrade. Cent- centigrade, okay. <laughs> centigrade. Fine, fine. We're, we're, yeah, we're about like, uh, about like that then. It's, C- I think it's about two centigrade here. But you said, then you said gusting up to 50 miles an hour, so you, you're mixing units there. <laughs> <laughs> this is all true. It's quite windy. And in fact, if you hear some whistling, it's the wind whistling through my window. Which yeah. seems to have stopped, Dixon. It was going crazy before. It was. So maybe it's. Oh, the Hammer Building still has that problem. Huh? Oh, it certainly does. The windows are leaky, but it seems to have stopped for Twiv. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. Well, still- when you say jump, the wind says how high, <laughs> <laughs> how fast. <laughs> yeah, there it is. I just heard a gust, Dixon. How about in Florida? Any winds down there? Uh, no, it is calm, clear blue skies. And 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which you just told me was 11 centigrade. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It is. I like the centigrade scale. Okay, today we have one, two, three, four, five papers on virus receptors. Wow. And they're just amazing. We're going to try and get through them all. Um, The first one just came out this week. Is that correct, Alan? Yes, it is a new uh, protein, cell protein required for entry of hepatitis C virus. And if you remember from our visits with Matt Evans, who I asked to come today, by the way, he couldn't make it to talk about these with us. There are quite a few entry factors for hep C, uh, CD81, SRB1, Claudin1, Occludin. And now we have Neiman Pick C1 identified in this paper for Hep C. Yep. Yeah, and one interesting thing about these proteins is um, they're pretty essential. I mean, they're they're not these are, these are not um, receptors that are only on a particular cell or something, or, or you know, very very restricted in expression or very narrow functions. Occludin, Claudin, these are all over the place. And Neiman Pick C, as we're, we'll talk about in a minute, this is a, a crucially important um, uh, metabolic housekeeping type of function going on. Right. Hmm. Right. So this paper, which is in um, it's in Nature Medicine. Yes. Nature yes. Nature Medicine. They they rationalize the the work. It's been known for a long time that cholesterol is really important for hep C infection. 
there's actually cholesterol in the virion, and cholesterol in the cell is also important for infectivity. It's another reason it's bad for you. Indeed. <laughs> in fact, it turns out that cholesterol is important for the entry of many enveloped viruses, not necessarily being in the virion, but in the cell membrane. Right, yeah. and um, the, it, it's important to note cholesterol, a lot of people, if you're not in cell biology, you might not realize this is, this is a, um, a molecule that is in all the cell membranes in your body, and it's necessary for, for retaining the right level of rigidity in the membrane, right? Right, right. Did you know, Dixon, that mosquitoes don't have cholesterol? I did, actually. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. Huh. And neither do plants. Right. So many of these flaviviruses require cholesterol. That's fascinating. Some people think when the mosquito takes a blood meal, it gets enough cholesterol to make sure. it susceptible. Absolutely. That was, here we go. Hear the whistling? Do you hear that, that's, guys? That's, oh, is that, that right? That is whistling. That's yeah, the that's, wind, That's huh? the wind. That's right. Does the tower move? Yes. It does. Of Listen, it does. If, we, if we disappear, you guys just go on, okay? Sure. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Except it won't be recorded. As right. an aside, every tall building over <laughs> 10 stories has to have a wind tunnel test first to make sure that it'll withstand winds. Mm. That is one big wind tunnel. Uh, well, it's a model, basically, yeah. Alan. So we were talking about cholesterol. So they decided right. to look at... Um, they is... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Who is they? Bruno Saints and uh, Barreto Martin Hiraga Imamura Hussein Marsh... You, Chayama, uh, Al Rafi, uh, in the in the senior author is Susan uh, Up uh, Upprichard, mm -hmm. uh, and they are at the University of Chicago, right? Yes, yes, University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, I'm sorry, University of Illinois Chicago. So I might to believe since I'm not. Um, privy to the details of this paper, that all of these molecules are part of an ecological cluster of molecules on the membrane, that they all serve as a touch point for this virus to enter? Or are they spread out? What are you talking about? What molecules? The, the all ones, these entry yeah, factors? these yeah, different exactly. entry factors. Well, how they work together is really not known, and that's what Matt Evans is trying to figure out. But you'll see today, the one, the one today is actually working probably in the cell. But right. uh, the others okay. may f may function on the surface sequentially. Right. There's a model. So, in this yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. It's important. It's important to realize that we're not necessarily talking about receptors here. Right. Oh, yeah. where, yeah. oh, where yeah. the virus uh, is binding factors, to something. Yeah. On yeah. Entry, entry factor. Entry factor. Right. There you right. Go. That's the distinction. Right. See, the title right. actually says entry factor, which is good. Got they, got, right. they got it right. Unlike got the New York it. Times, which would have receptors. <laughs> <laughs> Vince, lighten up. That's a good newspaper. They get it wrong sometimes, but you know, you have to cut some slack for the popular press. Right. So the um, so their reasoning initially is um, essentially they start with a lucky guess. They say, "Wow, cholesterol." I'll say this is a huge <laughs> leap. I, I I can't believe that there isn't a whole bunch of intervening steps here. Uh -huh. oh, right. But it's it's just funny reading the intro to this. Well, you know, cholesterol is really important for Hep C virus. Um, let's look at this particular cholesterol transporter, Neiman Pick C. Um, uh, Neiman pick C1 like one, right? Um, NPC 1L1, uh, which <laughs> is this this cholesterol sensing receptor on cells. Yeah, I'll bet you there's a whole stack of dead postdocs in between. I, yes, <laughs> yes. I was thinking, how many compounds did you try before you figured out the tungsten, Mr. Edison? Yeah, make right. make them out of work postdocs, please. Come on, let's let's keep this workforce going here. <laughs> so uh, NPC1, right? They focused on that, and who knows how how many others they looked at. This is a protein that starts out on the plasma membrane and then helps uh, bring cholesterol into cells and through the endocytic pathway and released into the cytoplasm, correct? Right. right. And it is an amazing protein. We got 13 transmembrane domains. Wow. Right? Right. That's right. Uh, There's a nice picture of that here, right? right? Right. This thing weaves in and out on the membrane and it transports cholesterol and it's really, really important. Right. So cholesterol ends, is, is in the extracellular environment. Cells take it up. It comes in through the endocytic pathway, which is this which pathway that, that brings stuff into cells. It, right, that, which means you get these internal blebs. The membrane blebs in so you have a vesicle in the cell. It's like and these vesicles are transported yeah, around. Exactly. And then these vesicles fuse with lysosomes. Aha. They lower the pH. They bring enzymes in. 
And then the cholesterol is released into the cytoplasm where it can be used by cells. Right. So the lysosome fusion basically makes a stomach out of the whole thing because the yeah, lysosomes yeah. are full of degradatory enzymes of one sort, degradatory enzymes of one sort or another. So exactly. the stuff in the endosome all gets chewed up so that it can be now recycled. Yep. Right. This, um, and so NPC is also a gene, well, there are a collection of them. Uh, which, when you have defects in them in people, cause very serious illnesses. Mm. And that's the name Neiman Pick, right, that originally came from uh, the disorder, Neiman, Neiman, Pick, Neiman Pick disease. Right. Neiman right. Pick syndrome or disease, right. Uh, apparently a neurodegenerative disorder, um, fatal in childhood. Right. That sounds really like a tragic situation. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It sounds to me like this is perfect for gene therapy too, right? Yeah, if you right. catch it soon enough. Yeah. I mean, you deliver a correct gene, then you can right. uh, maybe fix right. it. Right, so the, the defect, in fact, it's one of those rare genetic problems that, uh, that people have studied a lot because it gives a lot of insight into normal biology. Um, you have this defect in this cholesterol transporter, and what these kids develop is a, um, uh, essentially an, an Alzheimer's-like neurodegeneration, and then they die very, very early in life, like by age 10 or so. And this is because the cholesterol remains in, at least for some of the types, it remains in the vesicle rather than going out into the cytoplasm, right? Right. So you have big collections of fatty substances in various organs, even picks. So that, so at, at one point they figured out what the defect was, and that gave the, the gene its name NPC. And there are a number of them. So, Vince, right. is this the same uh, transporter that's um, important for reabsorption of cholesterol in the gut tract by um, epithelial cells? You know, it may be because there's a drug that hits this NPC1, and this is uh, supposedly blocking absorption in the gut, right, Rich? Yeah, I think that's right. right. Yeah. So, uh, so I want to point out that... Um, uh, just overview the general um, entry mechanism for HCV and the other viruses we're going to talk about. So HCV is a membraned virus, as is vesicular stomatitis virus that we're going to talk about, as is Ebola virus that we're going to talk about. And some membraned viruses enter by fusion of the viral membrane directly with a plasma membrane, which then dumps the nucleocapsid right into the cytoplasm. But that's not how these work and several other membrane viruses. What they do is they get taken up by endocytosis in exactly the fashion we've just described, where they contact the surface, and then there's this internal bleb that forms that then buds off inside the cells, and they have a vesicle containing the membrane virus. And now the task is for the membrane virus to fuse its membrane with the vesicle membrane, and that will uh, uh, result in dumping the nucleocapsid of the virus into the cytoplasm. And this is often coupled with other normal parts of the endocytic pathway, including fusion with lysosomes where the pH goes down. So anything that disrupts that normal process of endocytosis could theoretically impact on the n normal entry of the virus into the cell. Fair enough? Fair enough. Sounds good. good. Right, so they look. So now they look. Um, they've got this NPC one L one hunch, <clears throat> and they they found that sure enough, if you inhibit expression of this with small interfering RNAs on cultured cells, the cells become resistant to HCV infection. Right. So that's the first indication that this is this is an entry factor. And they use antibodies also to block. Right. And they find the same thing. It blocks. So this is infection with virus, Hep C virus in cells. And then, of course, there is this drug, ezetimibib. No, ezetimib. Alan? <laughs> it, I, think it's, I think it's ezetimib or ezetimib, um, but uh, uh, physicians would probably just call it Zetio, which is the brand name. It's a, it's a cholesterol-lowering drug. It binds. Actually, NPC1, you know, right? I've got it here in, in Wiki. If you hover <laughs> over the pronunciation, it tells you what it means. Go ahead. Oh, oh it, doesn't uh, pronounce, it doesn't pronounce it for you? <laughs> uh, no, uh, but it's as... Oh, that, there is a little speaker. Is that a mib? Is that a mib? Is that a mib? Oh, there is a speaker. It yeah. doesn't work on my computer. 
Ezetimib. Well, anyway, yeah, Ezetimib. Right. Ask right. for it by name at your local drugstore. Well, yeah, actually, <laughs> it's um, this is uh, a reasonable chance with 10,000 listeners that uh, a certain number of them are, are already on this drug. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's sold as Zetia. I, th- I think it may I think it's off patent, uh, which means there's a Zetimib generic, um, and then it's also um, combined with one of the statins to make uh, Vitorin which is another. Mm-hmm. Um, and these are prescribed as cholesterol-lowering drugs. Um, mm-hmm. And so the and that is the, I think that is the number one most prescribed class right. of drugs. Correct. Um, wow. So the, the, these are blockbusters. These are, there are millions and millions of people are on this stuff. So this one blocks NPC1 and that blocks the uptake of cholesterol into cells. Right. right. That's why it lowers your cholesterol. Is that right. that's for all cells or just the cells in the gut tract? It uh, is, it, is. It, should, it should operate on all cells, but pharmacodynamic studies of it, I think, have shown that um, it, it's given orally and it primarily affects right. the gut. Right, right, right. Okay, good. Because that's the entry point for hepatitis C also, right? Yes, and okay. it's the entry point for most of your cholesterol. Well, okay then. So we're dealing with a common What did path. you say? The entry point is the gut? Uh, the ep- entry point for your cholesterol is the gut. The yeah, then, Dixon, did you HCV. say hep- I said hepatitis C is a gut or uh, you no. catch it orally? No, we're going to the liver. Oh. It gets in uh, blood uh, You know, blood-borne. sex, yes. drugs. Okay. That sort Rock of thing. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, Not like hepatitis B. No, yes, like hepatitis B. Yeah, it's like hepatitis B. Yes, like hepatitis B. <laughs> oh, so what's the one you catch when you a, eat something? A. Hepatitis A. Hep A. All right, all right, all right, all right. But we don't actually know how it gets from the gut to the yeah, liver. I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs> it's a good question, yeah, Dixon. Good all right. So you got always three. stimulate good discussion. Well, it's done out of total ignorance, trust me. <laughs> this drug, anyway, inhibits hep C infection. Oh, okay. Okay, they, they did an experiment with cells. They add the right, drug. Right, Micromolar amounts, which is cool. And they also look at a bunch of different hep C isolates, which, you know, genotypes coming from different places and it inhibits all of them and that's good yes. and it works in a mouse model which is kind of an interesting mouse huh. model they have these um uh these immunodeficient mice that they have essentially replaced their livers with human hepatocytes right very tough one boy and, i don't want to use that mm. yeah that's got to be a really sick mouse so it does <laughs> it does protect them it does and it does protect them to some extent What's, what uh, I found even cooler was they have mice that – is that this paper? No, that's the other paper. Sorry. If the other paper have mice that are knocked out for this gene. Right. But they didn't use those in here because you have to right. use these weird uh, – so they, they put in hepatic cells into uh, depleted mice, right? Right. Which are, which are severe combined immunodeficiencies so they don't reject the uh, human exactly. hepatocytes. Exactly. Exactly, and they and they get when they pre-treat them with ezetimibe before giving them the virus, um, it protects them partially. Some of them still get infected, or eventually they still get infected, um, but uh, but it does seem to be providing some degree of protection. Right now, of course, this is you know this is in this mouse model that has no immune system, so it's a, yeah, it's right. a very artificial system. Mm-hmm. So then the the next question is, where is this drug acting? So they do a number of experiments to show that it doesn't affect binding, but seems to inhibit uh, fusion. If you remember, Rich was talking about how the virus membrane fuses in right. the endosome. That seems to be the step oh. that is prevent that is inhibited by the drug. Right, They're mixing up these papers here. So yeah, it's real easy to mix them up. Yes, right. thinking I, of I was ex- having the same. Problem. I'm thinking of experiments, so- but they're not from this paper. They're from another <laughs> right. paper. All right, so it's a late event, right before fusion, not binding. Right. Uh, the, they did a bunch of very cool experiments where they made viruses with less cholesterol, so you can you can manipulate the cholesterol <laughs> levels in viruses. And um, if you don't have a, if you have a lot of cholesterol, they're susceptible to inhibition uh, with this drug. But if there's not much cholesterol scarce virions, they call them, they have independent entry of this NPC one right. factor. Right. Right. So cholesterol is somehow directly involved in this. But if you don't have cholesterol, you can still get in by another mechanism. Right. Yes. Right. 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 Which that that and the partial protection in the mice suggests there's some other way mm-hmm. uh, the virus can can capitalize on. So this is, and in fact, they say as much in the paper. This is not something that's likely to be a standalone drug. It would be part of a combination. Right. 
treatment that you would give where you try to uh, do what we do with HIV. You, you inhibit the virus at multiple steps so that it, it has trouble replicating. If it does replicate, it has trouble getting to the next cell and so on. So if I were an epidemiologist, I would ask the following question. Since so many people are taking cholesterol and yes. drugs, and there's so what much hepatitis their, C out there. What is their hep C rate in people <laughs> who are on? Or, uh, yes. Now, what's the rate? I mean, does this actually work in principle out in nature? You could get a grant yeah. to do that, Dixon. Maybe that's already known. Maybe someone's done it already. Mm, I no. don't think anybody would have looked at that. Okay. But uh, but there are there are certainly, as we say, millions of people are on is yeah. that not? Yeah. And yeah. you could you could enroll a potentially enormous study sure. and look at HCV prevalence. You'd have to you'd have to make sure that your controls were demographically matched. Right. Um, you know, people who are on ezetimibe might tend to be an older crowd, whereas people who are first contracting HCV might tend to be a younger crowd. Um, but uh, but it would be interesting to look at that. Absolutely. So I realize that to... this is really mm -hmm. un-American of me, but wouldn't it be really <laughs> cool if we had uh, totally unified electronic medical records uh, that where we could have access to them so that when a question like this came up, boom, you could it. just answer the question. You could yeah. go to anonymized data and just... Yeah. 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 Trouble is, that I know who has this data. There are the insurance companies, but uh, we can't access their records. Right. So that the end of this, they say they don't know if NPC1 binds the virus or... Maybe in the endosome, it helps remove cholesterol right. and they expose don't. something that might be needed to they, uh, fuse, right? So what would be the experiment to prove that? Uh, we're getting there. They, uh, they, uh, they also say that NPC1 is expressed only on human and, human and, primary hepat and primate hepatocytes. Right, right. Uh, and so they're thinking that maybe That's cool. that has something to do with the tropism, the hepatotropism yeah, yeah. of the virus. Right. So if you put I want to keep mice. that in mind because uh, uh, this comes up in the other papers, I think. Uh -huh. well, remember, if you could, we have a mouse, a transgenic mouse, but it only does the early entry phases, right? Uh -huh. If you remember from that paper we did. Right, the, right. The virus just doesn't replicate well. And I don't know if it has to do with NPC or something uh, else. So you know? maybe if you got, okay. So maybe you can improve that by engineering the mice to express this in their hepatocytes. Maybe. Maybe. Um, um, okay. So in this paper, they did not look at knockouts, as we said before, because I guess to make this hybrid transplant mouse would be too difficult. Mm -hmm. Right. How would you fig You want to know how to figure out uh, the mechanism, Dixon? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I can't tell you the experiments. I'm going to write a grant on it. <laughs> <laughs> Other people are listening. <laughs> well, you'd have to see with and without NPC what the virus right. looks like in the endosome. You have to do some tough experiments where you're looking at the structure in the endosome. If you knocked that NPC, though, wouldn't you have a lethal mutant? Uh, well, you can make cells without NPC1. That's fine. Okay. You're talking about cell cultures, right? Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay, so that's a hep C. That's really cool. Because yeah. Now, the, the reason is, is also it's cool because a, a couple of months ago, Two papers had come out uh, revealing that this same protein, NPC1, is, is involved in Ebola virus infection. Ah. Now, when I went to the Harvard Virology Retreat last September, I heard a student in Jim Cunningham's lab present this story. So she had done it. Um, and that's one of the papers, which is in Nature. It's called... Small molecule inhibitors reveal Neiman PIX C1 is essential for Ebola virus infection. So that's Cote, Misasi, Ren, Bruchet, Lee, Philone, Hensley, Lee, Ori, Chandron, and Cunningham. You know, you don't realize how hard names are until you pronounce them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Try being the dean at a graduation ceremony at Columbia's Presbyterian uh, School of Public Health, and you'll find out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> they have uh, 210 students, and none of them are from this country wow. almost, and they've all got complicated names. So <laughs> here, <laughs> At least according to us. <laughs> here they were doing a screen for chemical inhibitors of Ebola. All right? That's how this started. Huh. They just wanted to find some drugs because sure. that would be a nice thing to have, right? Absolutely. Right, right. But here they use – they don't use Ebola, at least right now, for the screen. They <laughs> used what's called a – VSV pseudotype. 
Rich, take it away. <laughs> okay, so pseudotyping is an important technique in all of this because, you know, if you want to understand how Ebola gets into a cell, uh, if you can avoid it, you don't necessarily want to work on Ebola the first time around because then you got to dress up in a spacesuit and go to a <laughs> BSL-4 lab. So what you do is to dress up some other virus with the Ebola... Uh, attachment protein, the Ebola glycoprotein wow. that's on the outside. Wow. So uh, another membrane virus that's uh, a good tool for this is vesicular stomatitis virus, which, uh, like Ebola, is a negative sense um, single-stranded RNA virus that's uh, membraned. And uh, what you can do is to uh, build a virus that's got the Ebola glycoprotein uh, instead of the vesicular stomatitis glycoprotein mm, mm. on its surface. And so it's a wolf in bear's clothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, so I, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Uh, I'm blanking on or maybe didn't figure out exactly how they did it in this particular case. I mean, you can take a, you can transfect cells with a clone that's got uh, everything but uh, VSV except for the uh, surface protein and another clone that expresses the Ebola surface protein. Mm -hmm. Or I suppose you could build a recombinant that's VSV yeah, yeah. expressing the Ebola glycoprotein. Do you know which one they're doing here, guys? No, I I'm whatever whatever is easiest. I mean, you you have to put a bunch of plasmids in to get right. VSV out, and you just leave the one out for the glycoprotein, and, right. um, th and then you get uh, basically. Uh, if you do that, you get a virus that doesn't encode the e Ebola glycoprotein, but you get particles. Right. You, you don't get multi-round infection. Right. So you just get a single round of infection. Right. But it delivers the reporter, which in this case is a green fluorescent protein right. uh, gene, so they can measure uh, GFP activity in cells. If you wanted to make it replicating, you have to uh, make a recombinant, really. Not right, sure so the, with this pseudotyped virus with the reporter gene, you now have a way to assay um, situations where Ebola virus should be able to get into cells and situations where it shouldn't be able to get into the cells. Mm -hmm. And then you can use that to go fishing for drugs that would inhibit that process. Right. So they also have a control for specificity. They use a pseudotyped VSV with the glycoprotein from Lassa fever virus, which is a totally different family because mm. you don't want... I guess they wanted specific inhibitors for Ebola, although it would be cool to get a broad one, right? Well, but broad-acting broad, broad acting compounds are more likely to be false leads. Mm. So um, what, what you're going to do here, obviously, is set up an assay and say, okay, when we treat with saline solution, uh, we get entry, we get our reporter gene. When we treat with drug A, we get the same, drug B, and so on, drug ZZ5 or whatever, uh, we got this effect where it, it seems to be inhibiting yeah. entry. But if it inhibits entry of all viruses, it could be that it's just totally screwing up the cells. Mm. And then you end up with a toxic compound. So you want to, you, you'd like some degree of specificity. So they run a, li a chemical library with this pseudotyped virus, and they pick up a compound with the name of 3.0. <laughs> they have the structure here. It's a multi-ring extended structure. And then they add a benzene ring and make it more potent, and they call it 3.47. And interestingly, this is an amantadine derivative. Oh, oh yeah, it's right? amantadine on the left there, right. Amantadine being a drug that influences uh, or, uh, yes, uh, inhibits influenza virus uncoding, part of the entry process. Huh. It does so by blocking the ion channel in the flu virus particle. It's interesting. Because this is a multi-pass protein here. Uh, anyway, so they show that this compounds inhibit virus, and they. Uh, so this is sort of a side thing, but it's actually important for the end. It was it was shown before that a protease in the endosome called cathepsin B is needed for Ebola infection. And because it cleaves the glycoprotein of the virus, mm. and they just show that this drug does not target that protease, which would be one mechanism mm -hmm. of um, inhibition. Now, here's the leap of faith. <laughs> they treat cells with these drugs, and they say they develop cytoplasmic vacuoles that have cholesterol in them. <laughs> Here we go again. 
<laughs> Here we go again. Yeah, this is amazing. So they say, oh, there must be some proteins involved involved in cholesterol uptake. Hmm. Why would you even look for cholesterol? In well, the- <laughs> you know, uh, who knows? There may be another string of dead postdocs here. But uh, there's also, I mean, I would imagine that you look at this and the cells look funny. Uh, I don't know how you would. I don't you know, know how I, you would I, know I, to look for cholesterol, but they stain them with this compound uh, philippin mm-hmm. that uh, stains. It's a st- uh, sticks to cholesterol and fluoresces, and so they can easily identify these huh. things as uh, characteristic uh, cholesterol-filled vesicles in the cells. And yeah. and also, um, in my experience, cell biologists are a little obsessed with cholesterol. Um, okay. Because it's because it's so it, it's so critical to to the to the function of the membrane, um, you know, and you have these these lipid rafts that are there, and cholesterol is important, and all this membrane dynamic stuff that's going on. Um, that it's if your if your cells look funny, and you want to know why, and you go to a cell biologist, you say, "Hey, my cells look funny." That right. one of the things they're probably going to look at is is well, is cholesterol messed up? So. Sure. You know, remember, I heard this, this one of the students on this paper talk, give this talk, and uh, she, in fact, it was a big leap. She said it was amazing that someone had this idea that it would be cholesterol. So okay. It was. They didn't okay. have to go through a stack of postdocs. Yeah, but that. there's a ton of okay. pictures out there of uh, cholesterol accumulating in. Uh, maybe. Maybe that's part of it, yeah. In the aorta, for instance. I mean, there's a ton of uh, backlog on this that you could just rely on. Is Oh, I know what that is. Every time we see this, it turns out to be cholesterol. Even back in the 60s, I was privy to that information at Rockefeller because they were concerned about uh, atherosclerosis. So basically they said uh, we use mutant cell lines in cells treated with siRNAs, and they found NPC1. (laughs) Bingo. (laughs) And you know what? I bet the next person who's doing antiviral experiments and their cells look funny, they're going to look at cholesterol. Absolutely. It's the NF-kappa-B of pathology. Yes. (laughs) Uh, by the way, I just uh, I looked this up, and they uh, do indeed have a VSV that's deleted in its glycoprotein gene, ah. and they've grown that in the presence of a plasmid express, expressing uh, the Ebola virus um, okay. glycoprotein. So it's there pseudotyped and defective in replication, defective. And, okay. and, expre- and expresses GFP or something like that's, that. That's, okay. okay. So they basically do similar experiments showing that MPC1 is important for entry it's a late step um it's different from this cathepsin step uh it's late in uh, in viral entry like just before fusion and um they develop a model where the virus enters by endocytosis gets into the endosome cathepsin cleaves off a portion of the glycoprotein exposing a a binding site for the glycoprotein on npc1 and this this is where we get back to Dixon's question. Dix, uh, Dixon asked, "How would you prove whether or not the virus is actually binding to the protein?" And they have experiments here uh, that show that the cleaved uh, Ebola virus glycoprotein will actually uh, uh, bind directly to NPC one. They use oh, okay. uh, coimmunoprecipitation mm-hmm. experiments right. to show that. Right. Cool. And the drug then it would interfere with the binding of the cleaved glycoprotein to the NPC one. A really so nice the ca- picture here. In the case of Hep C, we don't really know whether that's going yeah, on, but yeah. in the case of this, it it looks like that's part of the mechanism. Mm-hmm. Now, um, is it in this paper or the next one? <laughs> the cholesterol independence is in the next paper, isn't it? I don't think they did those experiments here. Cholesterol independence. All right. So Hep C, if you interfere, uh, is cholesterol right. dependent? That's right. Yeah, but. Ebola is not, and I don't remember if it was in this paper, but it certainly is in the next one. All right, so they use a mutant of NPC1 that is defective in cholesterol uptake and found that this fully supports infection. Okay. All right, so the cholesterol function of NPC1 is not needed for Ebola infection in contrast to hep C. Yeah, so that suggests that mechanistically these are going to be at least a little bit different. Right. So that's the story, basically. And now they have an antiviral that could be used for further refinement and sure. development. Right. Yeah. Um, I like the what they say in the, in the discussion is very cool, that this model, you get cleavage of the glycoprotein and exposure of an NPC binding site, is analogous to the role of CD4, which binds 
GP120 on the virus, induces a conformational change to allow GP120 to then bind the co-receptor. That's during HIV infection. Right. So here you do the similar thing with a cleavage. With HIV, it's with a co-receptor. I wonder, mm-hmm. now we got two drugs here, right? We got the one that was in the Hep C paper and the one that's in the Ebola paper. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you swap those around if you get oh. similar effects. That would be the next thing to do. Yeah, that's probably already been done. We just don't well, know about I'll bet. What do you think? What's the prediction? Well, I would say mm, no. Well, it could be either way, but but it would be interesting, and it would speak towards the how different the mechanisms are and how different the mechanisms of action of the drugs are, because apparently there's some difference in the mechanism of these two, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe some similarities uh, as well. So it could go either way. If there's enough similarity in the mechanisms, the both drugs might do the same thing. Uh, if they're different, the drugs might uh, tap different parts in the pathway. I'm just thinking that the the cholesterol inhibitory drug from the previous paper, I mean, that interferes with cholesterol binding. And we know here that cholesterol uh, right. take isn't important. So right. it depends you how would, much they overlap. Right. It could go either way. But, but I would predict that <coughs> that drug will not inhibit... As a, what is it? As a vitamin? Is that a mime? Is that a mime? Ask for it by name. <laughs> Doesn't inhibit Ebola. That would be my right. prediction. Okay. But, and how about the other way around? Are we take we put uh, money on this. We, we, we could put a uh, satchels on it. Yeah, I was just gonna say pizza. Uh, right. uh, and the other way will, um, which will uh, uh, that's uh, the mantidine derivative compound three. Will that inhibit Hep C? No, um, I bet not. Uh, I think that, it's, yeah. it's so we have bad because remember that was pulled out in the screen, yeah. and it doesn't inhibit uh, Lassa virus, uh, and geez. I bet it doesn't inhibit right. Hep C. You're paying closer attention than. But me. you could do a similar drug screen for Hep C. That would be very interesting. Sure. So yes. my take-home lesson from a non-virological standpoint is that here's another example of an infectious agent that takes advantage of a normal cellular process of endocytosis plus acidification and cathepsin deactivation to actually make its own life cycle happen. Yes. And that's and a brilliant strategy for any so organism. That's what viruses do, man. You can't, yeah. oh, you can't out-evolve this. Every, well, you can. Everything <laughs> viruses do is safe-cracking, Dixon. So how would you, add, how would, okay, Vincent, you're, the now, you're now the Darwin of the future out evolve this procedure. What would you do? Well, you, let's say, how do you out evolve this drug, uh, ezetidamide, <laughs> ezetimid? No, I don't mean that. I mean, how would you out evolve the you fact that a, 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 a virus can get into you because your cathepsin D cleaves something and allows it to then attach to something else? How would you out evolve that strategy? How would you win against the virus? Yeah. You change, oh, you're not going to. You change, <laughs> no, <laughs> That's my point. The, no, but there have been arms races of the sort between viruses and antiviral <clears> proteins in cells. Okay, but you're talking about a, an essential functional I protein am. like this? I am. I think there's plasticity, don't you think? Yeah, there's going to be a plasticity, but at best you're going to end up with a stalemate because right. you can't evolve yeah, as right. fast as the virus. That's true. Plus your cathepsin D has to work the same way all the time. And it, it, it doesn't, it's not selected against because the viral pressure is there. It's selected for because cathepsin D is a useful process. Right, but there are also, there are also constraints on the virus side. But, Alan, you can have these purifying waves where, you know, everyone's killed except the ones with the rare allele. Right. right? True. We've I, seen but that. I, I find it unlikely that there's going to be a rare allele of even pick C1 that's going to be <laughs> protective against all these viruses. It would have to come after the cleavage, not, not during the cleavage. Actually, so, that brings up a, a good point in that um, I think it's in the next paper. They actually use cells from... Uh, NPC one patient. Yeah, I think this right. I should say. I should really say awesome. it's not likely that there would be a modification of Neiman Pick C one that would allow you to escape the virus and also allow you to survive and have a normal life. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I exactly. should. I should put that caveat in there. <laughs> that's a good exactly. point. So that's exactly. a, in fact, we do have yeah, examples right. of people with mutations, yeah, 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 yeah. and they yes. they would be resistant, but they still have the disease. Yeah. Right. So th- let's do the other paper. Ebola virus entry requires the cholesterol transporter Neiman Pick C one, which is published in Nature. By Karet, Robin, Wong, Herbert, Obernosterer, Mulkerhar, Kuhn, Kranzusch, Griffin, Ruthel, Sin, Dai, Whalen, Chandran, and Brummelkamp. 
I think this is a tour de force. This I really part. like this. Yes, yes this is terrific. This, this is the same issue of Nature, by the way. These are back to back. Is amazing. So they're just so what they did is a total genome screen, and what they do is they infect cells. They say we want to mutagenize the whole cell genome and find the genes that are important for infection with this virus, and, and they use a retrovirus to do that because retroviruses can integrate their genomes randomly and knock out genes, right? Importantly, right. they're starting out with cells that are haploid. Yeah, this is amazing. And this fascinated me. I went, I went back and looked where these cells came from. So a problem with doing genetics on eukaryotic cells is they're diploid. So yeah. if you knock out one copy of the gene, the other right. copy can... Uh, can do the job, so it's a very going to be a very rare event to knock out both genes. So it's easy, much easier to do if they're haploid. <clears throat> these cells have been around since 19, or the precursor to these cells have been around since 1999. They were from a leukemia patient. And they cultured out these cells, and uh, it just turned out no, they didn't do anything to them. It just turned out that these cells were uh, haploid, except for chromosome eight. And then in this paper, apparently that in some sort of independent effort, they were trying to looks like they were trying to make stem cells out of them because they're non-adherent hematopoietics like cells. So they transfected in these plasmids that transform things into stem cells, and they got out <laughs> adherent cells that no longer have the uh, markers for cells of the hematopoietic lineage. So they've probably done some of this stem cell reversion to these uh, cells because they no longer look like hematopoietic cells. Uh, and they're still haploid and even lost the second copy of chromosome 8. Okay? So they're totally haploid. So that's they're starting with a haploid cell line, which is amazing. I wasn't aware of these guys. Yeah, these are really cool. I wanted to do experiments like <laughs> this when I was a postdoc. Mutagenized cells with retroviruses. We always had this diploid issue, mm -hmm. you know? And so this is amazing. In fact, Steve Goff a couple of weeks ago was telling me, we were talking about some experiments, and he said, oh, yeah, you can just get these haploid cells from so-and-so. He'll send them to you. <laughs> this is just amazing. So you can take those and infect with retroviruses and make a library where, and in fact, they, they did this and, and deep sequenced the entire library wow. and showed that they had 800,000 insertions. Good heavens. So the deal is they use a retrovirus. The retrovirus must have a selectable marker on it, right? Yeah. So that you yeah. can select out cells. You can specifically culture out cells that have a retrovirus integration. Right. Right. And right. the retroviruses also have in them a, a strong polyadenylation signal from SV40. So if you try and transcribe the gene that has the retrovirus insertion, somewhere during the transcription, you're going to get a polyadenylation, so you can't, a cleavage in polyadenylation, so you can't finish the transcription. So it effectively knocks out, uh, the, that makes a null mutation in that gene. And you want to do a low MOI, so you just get, you know, Right, so you get single insertions. Single insertions. So you can make a library of guys that, each of which has a single insertion and, you know, by probability, they're all going to be in different genes. And it s seems to me that there's, there's, uh, there's some subtleties here. First of all, you're only going to target genes that are non-essential for growth of the cells in culture. Correct. Right? Right. So right. initially, that struck me as a disadvantage. Uh, and in some respects, for depending on what you're doing, that could be a disadvantage. But it also struck me later on that that's an advantage because if you're looking for uh, things that you want to target for antiviral therapy, you want things that are not absolutely essential for growth of the cells. So you're going right. to pick up things in this screen that the cells don't absolutely need. Now, it turns out that this particular thing, if you at an organismal level, is uh, essential, if sure, you like. Sure. Okay? You can't right. knock it out completely. But it's, it, it's an interesting aspect of this. So then you take this library, you infect them with a pseudotype virus with the Ebola glycoprotein, like we talked about in the previous paper, and you get and you look for resistant cells. Right? You kill off all the cells that are susceptible. <laughs> Easy <Yeah>. assay. <laughs> right. You kill the ones. Yeah, you're you're left with the resistant ones. ones. Right. I have to do this for my virus. See, this is what you have to do if you if you can't make a lucky guess. 
That's right. <laughs> yeah, some of us can't make guesses. I, I want to do this. So they picked up actually a number of genes that are involved in the vesicular transport pathway in cells, the way endosomes come from the surface and move around cells and then go back out again. So they've got this they got this pool of resistant cells and as you said they deep sequence them and they must they must identify the insertion sites as bits of sequence where you have retrovirus next to some cellular DNA. Yeah, you just use or uh, well, you could deep sequence or just prime with retroviral sure. primers, right. you know, vector primers. And so that identifies the cellular sequences yeah. uh, that where the retrovirus is. So that that allows you to identify what genes the retroviruses are inserted in. Amazing. And one of them is cathepsin B. What a great validation of the right. whole thing. Right, that's the known protease needed to, for an entry, as we talked about before. Right, and then they get uh, genes uh, of this hops complex, which <coughs> which is involved in fusion of endosomes and lysosomes, and there's six subunits, and they get mutations in all the six genes encoding the six subunits. Wow. So this makes sense because endosome lysosome fusion is important for virus entry. But then again, of course, their strongest hit is Dixon. <laughs> cholesterol NPC1 yeah, NPC1 NPC1 cholesterol binding and it's the same NPC1 that was in the other paper <laughs> they identify it in the other paper they got it through a drug here they get it genetically the parsimony of evolution is incredible and they show that they get NPC deficient fibroblasts from a patient and show that these are resistant to infection yep with uh, the, the Ebola and in fact they try a whole lot of phyloviruses Including uh, Marburg, yeah. and, it's, uh, yeah. uh, and apparently all of them use this um, <laughs> or require this uh, NPC one for infection. However, a bunch of other viruses, what herpes, adeno, flu, polio, coxsackie, VSV, Rift Valley fever, mm -hmm. um, are all can all infect these NPC mutant cells. Right. So it's specific for the. Phyloviruses. Right. I think that... Uh, they didn't do Hep C here. Oh, yes. Yeah, so Is that another way, then, of classifying viruses? What's that, Dixon? <clears throat> to, uh, to take their entry um, uh, biochemical pathways and, and cluster them. Sure. Rather than yeah. doing it by uh, their genomes or other things. <laughs> uh, it could be a factor to use in classification, sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one thing that I like here, they have mice that are heterozygous NPC1 knockouts. And interestingly, they are protected. They're heterozygous. They're not null. I guess null is lethal mm. for NPC1. Mm. But the heteros right. are protected. Interesting. I don't know if it's a gene hmm. dosage effect or what. Can't be in right. the uh, haploid cells. Sorry? It can't be in the haploid cells, can it? Just only one dose. No, no, these are animals. Animals. That, uh, uh, yeah. uh, animals. I'm, I'm still absorbing everything I've heard up to this point. Sorry. My computer runs a little but slower than yours. But he makes a point. It's, the haploid cells have one copy, yeah. right? And the mice have one copy. Yeah. So there's some disconnect between the cells and the mice. That's true. Right, guys? You get yeah. that? You see that? Yeah. So that's the same protein as identified in the other... Same model for infection that we talked about, but in a, a totally different way. And I think this is so cool. But the haploid cells have, pro have presumably developed some way of uh, upping their transcription of a bunch of critical genes in order to make up for their haplo insufficiency. Oh, you think there's duplication then of the ones that are really necessary? In e either doses? duplication or just overexpression, I would think. I mean, how if does a cell get rid of all of its chromo half of its chromosomes? In a well, mutation? that's yeah, that's a whole other ball of wax. Is that that's, a that's just an amazing mitotic finding. spindle defect or something? I don't know, I, but well, it, it was a cancer cell, so yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a yeah. great resource. It's a great reagent. Yeah, fabulous. So cool for viruses. It, I mean, I'm sure for many other things. But I'm surprised we uh, haven't made them. Though I mean, wouldn't that be a fairly easy thing to do? I don't know how you would make them. Well, you'd, you'd create a defect in the mitotic spindle, so when the chromosomes Maybe. form, yeah, that's a good they idea, can't. Dixon. Yeah. Or the centromere, either one of those two. So they do the same thing, same sort of thing in this paper, where they uh, show that this is a post-uptake issue. Hmm. Great. Uh, uh, I'm getting a lot of fuzz here. What's going on? Yeah, you got a Are lot you? of fuzz. Uh, yeah. Are you? <laughs> 
No, uh, I hear some hissing, but uh, uh, right. okay. it's just the it's, uh, gone. it's the hissing of summer lawns. Okay. <laughs> only, so, uh, only yes, Joni. Uh, yes, Joni. Oh, Joe, you knew that. <laughs> of course, of course. Oh, I'm so impressed. I figured no one would get it. <laughs> I don't get it either. Uh, Joni Mitchell had a wonderful song. On it's that. a song, Joni Mitchell. Okay. All right. So at any rate, they go through the same thing here where they show that the uh, affected step is post-uptake. Uh, and uh, what I really like is they got these nice electron micrographs yeah. that show these virus particles in vesicles inside the cells apparently trapped there. I think that's ah. cool. Right. Yeah. This is where they belong, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shall we move to the last set of receptors? Sure. sure. All right. This is a totally different virus, measles virus. And this is uh, technically less cool, but it explains a lot of measles biology. So measles- I don't know. There's some coolness technically here. Somebody yeah, wrote a, a wonderful a struggle, review in Science on that recently, I understand. It's okay. It's not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I wrote a, a commentary. Yeah. You did. Um, but the, the whole story, I thought, we, we, was on our list before I did that, Dixon. Okay. I did. It's a really cool story. So measles, of course, is a used to be a common childhood infection until we prevented it with vaccination. Mm. You inhale the virus, it replicates in your lungs, it spreads systemically, and you get a rash, and then you cough out virus to infect other people. So people have identified various receptors for measles. One of them is called CD46, but this is only used by the vaccine strains. So wild-type measles, that's not a receptor for it. And then subsequently, another protein was identified called CD150. And now it turns out that CD150 is not expressed on the respiratory epithelium. Oh, that present, that's a problem. That's then. a problem, right? Yeah. It's expressed actually in immune cells. Uh, what are you going to do? It's expressed in immune cells <laughs> in the lung but not the respiratory epithelium. Ah, the immune cells. So people started looking for respiratory-specific uh, receptors. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that first, then we'll get back to the biology. Mm-hmm. Um, so these two papers, they basically say, oh, what proteins, membrane proteins, would be in an epithelial cell line? So they, do, they look at the results of like, microarrays and expression studies, and they compare... A susceptible and non-susceptible respiratory epithelial cells or other types of epithelium and try and narrow down the differences in the membrane proteins. Mm. And then they take them if they get, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 or 100, and they start testing them. They right. get the individual cDNAs and they put them in cells and they see if they confer mm. infection by measles virus. So that's, Rich, why I say it's not as cool as the others because it's right. kind of a... But I liked, the, I liked the genome-wide screen and, you know, looking mm. at... Uh, candidate proteins um, uh, from susceptible or unsusceptible cells. Yes. So uh, it's torturous work. So that's kind of a, a nice. <laughs> it's a nice approach for sure. You use bioinformatics and then you do some experiments. You have to wake right. up all those postdocs so, and get them back to work. Yeah. You know, one of these. Uh, one of these papers, the Nature paper, they they actually go through and they tell you a little bit. Uh, about the stuff that didn't work. We identified 175 transmembrane proteins preferentially expressed in permissive cells. Uh, amongst these, uh, cDNAs of 22 that had preferential uh, expression ratios or interesting biological characteristics, they tested none of these proteins confer susceptibility, right? So at least one uh, very ill postdoc or a couple right? <laughs> <laughs> got, a, got an honorable mention right. for all that stuff that didn't work. This, right. this is difficult stuff. Of course. You know? But worth doing in the end, right? Sure. All right. Hey, Rich, can you plug and unplug, please? Sure. So the first paper came out in PLOS Pathogens. This is Noyce, Bondre, Ha, Lin, Sisson, Sow, and Richardson it's from, out of Canada. And this was published, actually, uh, last August, 2011. Am I here? Yeah, well, yes. You are. are. You're here. Okay. And we're talking about the PLOS pathogens paper. Okay. They identified a epithelial cell receptor. Okay? It happens to be called PVRL4 or Nectin-4. PVR happens to stand for poliovirus receptor. Ooh. Vince, you might know something about that. 
I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're the world's expert. Come no. on. Actually, when we discovered the polio receptor years ago, yes. subsequently people uh, found related genes in various species. And this is one of them, PVRL4. It's not a receptor for polio, but here it's a known protein, and they find it's a measles epithelial cell receptor. Uh-huh. So this PLOS pathogens paper, they do the usual experiments. They show that this expression of this protein confers susceptibility. If you block it with antibodies or siRNAs, you know, it blocks infection, uh, and it supports attachment of virus. So that's what they find in that paper. And they, they say one thing that's very interesting. Keep this in mind. It's expressed on both the apical and basolateral surfaces of cell lines. Uh-huh. This is very important. Right. Okay, then we go to the second paper. Uh, Adherence junction protein nectin-4 is the epithelial receptor for measles. This was just published in December 2011 in Nature. Uh, Muleback, Matteo, Sin, Prufer, Ulig, Leonard, Navaratanya, Frenzke, Wong, Sawatsky, Ramachandran, McRae, Chutek, Von Messling, eh, Lopez, and Catanio. That's the one I can pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto Catanio. So you said that's on the apical side, Vince? Both of cell lines. Both, and cell lines, and culture. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Now, uh, what these individuals had done before this paper is, is a very important experiment. They made a measles virus variant. They made mutations in the glycoprotein, the attachment glycoprotein, that would not recognize nectin-4. Okay? And when they infect uh, primates, they have a primate model for, I think it's macaques for uh, measles. That virus infects them. Um, It makes a viremia, but they don't shed it in their respiratory secretions. Goodness. Isn't that interesting? So the model began to be developed <coughs> that... So it turns out that, sl, that this SLAM receptor, uh, CD150, is expressed on immune cells in the lungs, and that's how the virus gets into you. It infects immune cells. The immune cells go across your epithelium, deliver the virus to your blood, and then it spreads everywhere and replicates. Uh, they find in this uh, Nature paper that, in fact, Nectin-4 is at the junctions of epithelial, respiratory epithelial cells uh, on the basolateral side of the cells. Right. Not now that's a, the side facing the blood. Facing the blood, not the apical side. Right. Which is the side facing the air. Right. right. So the idea is the virus, when it's replicating in your blood, then hits this receptor, nectin-4, on the basolateral side of the mm-hmm. respiratory epithelial cells, mm-hmm. replicates in them, comes out, the virus comes out on the other side, and right. that's how you cough it out. Amazing. Yes. So this is the the epithelial receptor, and it explains how the virus gets out of you. Because if it's brought into you by immune cells, the conundrum is, how does it get out? Right. 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 And this is it. So that's why I think this is just beautiful. Yes. So the the receptor on the immune cells that takes up the virus to distribute it to the blood, the virus then gets into the blood. Now, that same receptor must also be on other cells inside the body, apart from the respiratory tract, in order for it to replicate. So yeah. which cells in the body supports the replication of my measles virus? Well, it's on uh, immune cells that would be distributed uh, throughout but your body. But measles is not an immune-deficient disease. Oh, sure it is. Is it? Absolutely. That's the actual presentation well, of measles? One of the complications is well, everyone ex- infected develops immunosuppression. Because it kills off the immune cells yeah. by replicating yes. inside them. Yes, and in fact, you often have very serious secondary infections uh, after uh, measles. Most people recover, and if you are in a <laughs> hygienic situation, you don't get bad infections. But right? I knew but, someone who worked on SSPE, which is a subacute sclerizing panencephalitis due to latent measles virus infection. How does that work out? That's a different story, I think. That's way down the road with uh, some genetic information of measles left over in, uh, in the brain. Yeah, but how does it get to the brain if the immune cells are... We don't know. That's a very puzzle. I don't know puzzle. that it's known, right? This is a puzzle. It's just the age, right? It's a long-term sequelae. So it's, it only uh, replicates there, the immune cells? But there is cells? also a lot of interaction um, between the brain and the immune cells. 
uh, which yeah. was not was not previously appreciated 30, 40 years ago. People thought of the brain as being an immunolo- immunologically privileged compartment. Yeah, but it's less um, to get across. The- but it, it turns out that there there is a lot of traffic going across the blood brain barrier okay. um, that's okay. related to immunity. I mean, what we do know is you you get infected with measles as a kid, then thirty to forty years later you develop this SSPE. Right. right, and you can't find infectious virus any no. any longer. But no. it is a neurodegenerative illness, and it's always fatal. So, yeah, it involves the CNS. But and people have thought that it's persisting virus, okay. but not really sorted out. All right, at all. So, so, just to go back and reinforce what I've just learned for the first time in my life is that the measles is an immune cell disease that could result in immunodeficiency if it goes to completion. It re- it replicates in lymphatic tissues and immune cells only. for sure. Not only no, it replicates in your skin. That's why you get the rash, right? So is that dendritic cells that it's in? It replicates in macrophages, dendritic cells, T I cells, see. all right, and then other uh, all re- right. any any okay. respir- any re- epithelial cell that has nectin four, and it is expressed on other uh, epithelial cells. Right, uh, will replicate the virus. For okay, example, just... ovarian, lung, and breast tumors. Oh. So if you happen to have one of those and you get measles, you could use it to treat them. Then it is. Well, being- that's one of the things they talk about here. Yeah. yeah. So okay, so it's restricted. All right, I've learned something. I, I was totally unaware of well, that. Well, this is brand new. This whole thing that see, we used to think that measles infected your epithelium yeah. in your lung and got yeah, in and exactly. got out the same way, but, but there's no receptor on the epithelium right. on the apical side. Right. So it, then. This group, the Catania's group, did a number of very interesting macaque studies uh, showing that, in fact, the virus infects immune cells in the lung. So it's immunotropic. Yeah. And that's that's, that's that, I love it. I love it. I love it. The, the immune, your immune cells bring it in. Macrophages and dendritic <laughs> cells bring it in. It's a Trojan now, horse. <laughs> right. Now, on the other hand, does it, does it get out to any degree through the same immune cells? They're there uh, in the lung, right? Uh, in these animal studies, all the virus production in the lung is by um, later infection, that is, is by the respiratory epithelium. Okay. There's no immune cells later on. There, because there's, there's a, this other receptor that it can get into the cells with, right? Uh, right. On the basal from side, the ap- yeah. From the basal side, exactly. It's just a beautiful story. Wow. It's really, yeah. And I like wow. that it's a polio-related wow. receptor. Wow. It's wow. just yes. so cool. <laughs> uh, so is it the same measles virus attachment protein that is contacting both receptors. There's a, there's a, measles has two major glycoproteins on the surface. Uh, one that's called a hemagglutinin neuraminidase, which is, I understand it, is the attachment protein. And another is a fusion protein that catalyzes the fusion of the measles uh, virus membrane with the, with the cell membrane. And in this case, it is a direct fusion, right, of the virus with the plasma membrane, that's I believe. That's correct, yep. So... <clears throat> Is it the same virus glycoprotein that's contacting both these different receptors? I believe I it think... is. I believe okay. it is. Um, this paper where they um, mutated the attachment protein so it would not bind nectin, but it still bound other receptors. That's how they could grow the virus. Okay. Um, I believe that was HN. All right. So it's like a, it's like a bifunctional Recept- uh, virus attachment protein. It seems to be. Because it's seeing two different receptors. Yeah, it seems to be. I'm going to look it up right now. <laughs> so he, that was a, a actual key experiment, I think. It's so cool. A key, and that's what I called it. In a key experiment, rhesus macaques infected with a mutant that could not bind to epithelial cells develop viremia and rash, but the virus is not shed into the airways. That's JCI, uh, so, Journal of Clinical Investigation. So they didn't know that it wasn't binding nectin-4. All they knew was that they had a mutant that yeah. didn't bind epithelial cells. Fine. Okay, at I was that confused time. about that. Okay, at, fine. At that time. But it turns out that the the culprit is nectin-4. Okay. Yeah, let me see yeah, that's about brilliant. The, the attachment. Measles virus blind to its epithelial cell receptor remains virulent in rhesus monkeys but cannot cross the airway epithelium. Uh-huh. So they didn't know it was nectin-4. Right. Let's see how they did that. I'm just going to look it up. Catania and Leonard. One moment. I'll tell you. Good thing uh, they must have just screened for viruses, somehow screened for viruses that couldn't infect epithelial cells. No, they cells. made... They made they or site-directed mutagenesis. Yeah, they did site-directed based on the, the structures. Um, let me just... I got it. I'm almost there. <laughs> 
we identified residues of the measles attachment protein, which is HN, right? Right. And they um, then they mutated those residues and generated a epithelial cell blind virus. So it's the same. Uh, it's the same protein. And in that paper, they say thus the epithelial receptor is probably a basolateral protein. They guessed. Ah. Isn't that great? <laughs> so in, epi- in, in epithelium, yeah. this protein is localized to the basal lateral right. surface, correct? Right. Correct. Right. Whereas it, in culture, it's, both, it's yeah. both. It's both. So it's the H protein that they mutagenized, Rich. Hmm. Okay. H, H, N, all the same. It's the same thing? Okay. Yeah. So there are, are there groups of people out there with variants of the Nectin-4 protein that are not susceptible to measles as the result? Good question. Good question. Yeah. So uh, I want to see a structure of, I'm sure they do too, of this um, receptor bound to e- uh, the receptors, each of the two receptors bound to this virus attachment protein. Yeah, that would be I cool. want to know if it's, you know, there are different binding sites, how this is going on. That's amazing. Well, wait, if people were variant in Nectin-4, wouldn't they still be susceptible but not able to transmit? Ah, good point. Yeah, that's right. They would have right. they'd uh, get sick. CD150 still. Yeah. Yeah. Right, they'd get sick, but they wouldn't pass so it on, which would be harder to, <laughs> and then, uh, harder to identify. If they're very rare, you would never... Yeah, you'd never see them. Uh, yeah. Okay. Although in, over thousands of years, they may be selected for. I don't well, know. that's that's what I'm driving at. Are there pockets of people throughout? Well, but the it world? wouldn't it wouldn't help them. <clears throat> no. No, it would help their. Yeah, you're right. Neighbors. It doesn't help them. <laughs> I'm not sure there's a selection for altruistic genes, is there? Um, there's a lot of debate about that, but yeah. so, certainly, I mean, <clears throat> it wouldn't it wouldn't help them, and probably wouldn't help their family because their family would be yeah. carrying the same yeah, gene. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, so that's that. Those are our receptors. Wow, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, let's do a couple of emails. Sure. All right. First one is from Nam, who says, I would go with that week, that week in virology for the title of your 30-second segment. You can keep the same acronym we all know and love, though I suppose this might cause confusion. <laughs> <laughs> that week in virology. What, what did you suggest, uh, Alan? Uh, that was the day? Or, no. Oh. It was on the last podcast, anyway. Yeah. This day in virology. Anyway, so I found this week an article in, I think, a Stanford University newspaper uh, called The Province. Is that right? No, that's something else. And it's, it's called The Province. I don't know where this paper is from. And it's called On This Day in History, What Happened on Previous January 10th? And... 1947, Stanford University reports the isolation of polio virus after three years of research. So this is sort of in the spirit of what we want to do. How did you ever find this? I have a a daily Google search for polio virus. (laughs) (laughs) Of course he does. It turns out. Of course he does. Now, the problem is that the virus was isolated in 1908, of course. Mm. What what Carlton Schwert did at Stanford was to crystallize it in the 40s. Ooh. Ah, okay. And so he was trying to figure out how to grow it purely and, and stuff, and that's what he did in 47. He figured out how to grow it and purify it on gradients and so forth. Didn't Enders and all those people get the Nobel Prize for culturing cells so that you could grow polio in vitro? Yeah, intro? that's correct. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, okay. Correct. Okay. So uh, what is 1947? How many years ago is that? Mm. Uh, that is uh, 64 years ago. So 64 years ago, on January 10th, Carlton Schwartz figured out how to pur- purify polio so he could crystallize it. There you go. What I like is uh, <laughs> in 1949, on the same day, RCA announced uh, the uh, uh, a new format for music recordings, the 45. Ooh, mm-hmm. that's cool. I grew up with this. Yeah, we did. I <laughs> still have had a, Yeah, Me too, oh, me too actually. That was did. still... <laughs> Okay, right. so uh, maybe we'll start this next time, okay? So one of okay. us come up with a third. Actually, I grew up in a point where you shouldn't drop the records because they'll break. <laughs> yeah, those are the thick, uh, heavy plastic ones, the right? Yeah. The 78s, the yeah. 78s, um, Alan, would you read the next one? Sure. Uh, Stephanie writes, Dear Twivers, on last week's Twiv, you mentioned the concept of the meme. While the common usage of the word meme may be synonymous with the concept of an idea gone viral, I'm too big a fan (laughs) of Dawkins not to write you guys to flesh out his definition. 
Richard Dawkins, a prolific writer on the subject of evolutionary biology, first coined the term meme in a book, The Selfish Gene, discussing evolution. He observed that like genes, ideas and concepts can be passed on through the, through the generations through a form of natural selection. Uh, and I think she's quoting from another book here. Uh, ideas and behaviors that proved most adaptive for our species survived and flourished, replicating themselves in as many minds as possible. And uh, she cites Susan Blackmore for people who wish to learn more about memes. The um, uh, book is called The Meme Machine. <laughs> so that's, there you go. Right. His, his original definition was uh, did not apply to um, uh, honey badgers and hamster dance and what have you. Uh, it, was really, it was about useful ideas, you know, yeah. how, to, how to beat a rock into an arrowhead and that sort of thing. You know, he has a new book out, by the way, where he's going to debunk all of the children's mythologies that, that are out there. So he's got a book about modern mythology and magic, and he says mm. that there's magic in nature. There's Which enough there is. magic oh, yeah. in nature that without having to invent it. Cool. It, it got an interesting review. Uh, Rich, would you read the next one, please? Sure. Andrew writes, Hello from Raleigh, North Carolina. First, I'd like to thank Twiv, Twip, and Twim for sharing such great information on the micro. <laughs> I marvel that this world is really a thick soup of life and viruses. Oh, that's a great way to put it. Which is neither a bad thing nor a good thing, but just how life has evolved yeah. on this wet rock. <laughs> I've always been interested in biology, but also by history. So when I watched the Showtime series, The Tudors, a few episodes oh, yeah. piqued my attention. These episodes portrayed the English sweating sickness epidemic of 1528 and the absolute terror it caused. It showed people both suffering from the disease and people, including the king, worrying themselves to sickness. While this disease is a dramatic rec uh, recreation, uh, the uh, epidemic did exist. Uh, While well, the series is a dramatic uh, uh, recreation, the epidemic did exist, but I could only find limited information on this time period. Hmm. What is this sickness? How can modern virologists, microbiologists learn about this plague? And the $64,000 question, is it important to examine history for past afflictions? Mm. Once again, thanks for podcasting. I can't wait for you guys to tackle this one. <laughs> uh, he, he, he signs it, eager learner. Do you know about this, any, any of you guys? Uh, I just looked it up on uh, Wikipedia, and that's all I know. Yeah, yeah I, I had not come across this before. So there are some papers on it, but um, there is. It could be viral. It could be bacterial. Could be like no typhus. One knows. But, but typhus the question like is: could be typhus. Yeah. But that precedes cholera. There, it's a long there time ago. <laughs> there definitely seems to be uh, an, epi uh, an epidemiologic pattern for the spread right. of this thing. Sure. That um, uh, looks like an infectious disease. I mean, his question, is it important to examine history for past afflictions? I think the answer oh. is yes, right? Oh, yeah, no sure. question about yeah. it. I mean, it's fascinating. There's Absolutely. a ton of great books out there on that subject, too. If we could put them on to, you know. But books. we have to be careful when we do that because, especially when you go this far back, um, a lot of the descriptions from, from that time period are going to be so vague by modern standards that it could be anything. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but, Alan, but you know as well, the Chinese were absolute spectacular uh, record keepers and drew pictures and everything else so that you can tell when smallpox hit those places. Yes, you can tell, you can tell if, there's, if you're talking about a d disease that has a very characteristic yes, pathology. Yes, that's right. Um, right. And there's uh, the slide that I think Vincent probably still puts in every talk with the, the Egyptian steel with the yep. um, withered limb paralysis, uh, which is uh, almost sure. almost diagnostic of polio. I mean, it's possible that the yeah, person yeah. had something else, but it's yeah. really, really likely that that was a, a documentation of polio. Wait. Um, but if you have something like this where, okay, profuse sweating and um, the, uh, the, the nebulous flu-like symptoms and some people died, um, that's, it's right. really nonspecific right. and just about anything could have caused no, you're, that. You're quite right. So what has been become uh, frequently done now is to exhume some old <clears throat> graves. Exactly. Yes. And, for example, they did that and they could recover some plague sequences very recently from – from mass burials. And where was that, Vince? Somewhere in, in the UK, I believe. No, right? no, no. It was in Vilnius. Was it? Yeah. Ah. It, it was. And it was Napoleon's army. Okay. And they had died of an epidemic typhus. Yeah. 
that was well, a plague. I, I'm no, sorry. I'm talking about plagues. I, I, that's exactly right. So those like, were two different plagues. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you can do this. The, the problem I understand here is that most of the known graves are royalty, so you would have to get Queen uh, Elizabeth uh, to approve it, and I doubt she would do that. And you have to – it has to be a disease that would have left evidence that way. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So plague, you can tell – yeah. In a variety of ways that they're, you know, these forensic uh, sure. anthropologists can tell what kinds of disease. But arthi- osteomyelitis, osteo, yeah. uh, what right. am I trying to say here? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So I think it would be interesting to figure out what it was because you can learn from these things. But in this case, unless you identify a oh. substantial... What? What's that? Oh, I'm, I'm just pointing my finger that I just remembered that they <laughs> recovered some plasmodium falciparum sequence from the skull of King Tut. Oh, yeah? That's oh. right. Yeah, I remember that. It yeah, was published, right. yeah. That's right. That's right. So the answer is yes. All right. The next one is from Iwut, who writes, Dear me and other members of the TWIV team, recently an orthobunyavirus, a new one named Schmollenberg virus, after the German town where it was first detected last November among livestock, is was circulating in the Netherlands and Germany, causing diarrhea among cattle and congenital malformations in lambs. Here's the URL to a recent human risk assessment made by Dutch colleagues. The impact for humans seems so far to be very small, only theoretical, but for the veterinarians, it's very relevant. It's unknown where the virus came from and if it's here to stay. No hard feelings if your podcast is already too overbooked with other interesting viral issues, <laughs> but maybe it's educating and interesting to mention this newly discovered virus. Best regard. Thanks for all the interesting podcasts. Iwut is an MD in communicable disease control in the Netherlands. Great. Cool. So he sent a link to a ProMed mail announcement of this virus. Nice. Uh, very recently uh, discovered, 19th... Of November 2011, a new orthobunyavirus. Causes diarrhea in cattle and, and congenital malformations in sheep. And, of course, the concern, one of the concerns is whether or not it could get into people and right. cause any problem. And they're thinking yeah. unlikely. Yeah. Exactly. They do point out that there are related human viruses. Mm-hmm. One of them is called Oropuche virus. <laughs> and I, when I was visiting Brazil, my host... Um, said his son had uh, been infected with this virus, which is carried by a biting bug. Oh, what was it, a midge? I don't remember. And his son was working in his lab, and he took blood, and he, he PCR'd the, the virus <laughs> out of it. And there's actually some publications in, suggesting that this is actually a zoonotic infection that's increasing in uh, frequency in Brazil and South America. Mm-hmm. But whether this would do the same thing, who knows? So this is really new, so we don't know much about it. Uh, this uh, raises in my mind this thing. We talked about One Health a while ago where the initiative here is to make sure that the you need to unplug- medical I'm community sorry. is in touch Rich, with the, yeah. You need to unplug again. Sorry. Oh, dang. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, beautiful. Wow. Good. Okay. Nice. So uh, this reminds me of what we were talking about a few weeks ago. Uh, the One Health Initiative, where the idea is to put uh, keep the medical community and the veterinary community in touch with each other, oh, wow. uh, because there are so many diseases that are zoonotic in nature, uh, the medical community has to be aware of this. They have to be communicating with each other all right, the time. Right, right. Alan. Okay, so Marie writes, Greetings, TWIV crew. Thanks for your informative and entertaining podcast. On a natural medicine website, I came across this paper being used to support avoiding vaccines. And she gives a link to a PubMed um, result. Um, My understanding of this study from a brief skimming is that children with uh, cystic fibrosis who received the annual flu vaccine had a lower CD8 T-cell count. Um, CD8 T cells broadly, broadly reactive against influenza A than non-CF children who did not regularly receive the vaccine. What are your thoughts on this study? Is it valid to compare a non-CF group with a CF group? Have there been any studies done examining actual risk of influenza infection in those who have regularly received the vaccine in past years versus those who have never received a vaccine in a year when neither group receives the annual vaccine? Mm. <clears throat> so this is... This is another one of these, um, yeah. <laughs> hey, you look at one of the authors. Yeah. Actually, I thought this was an interesting paper. It is right? an interesting paper. Uh, so this is, um, 
uh, Bodoes et al. and uh, and Fouchier and Osterhaus are both uh, authors on it, uh, which is what Vincent was just pointing out. Um, yeah, so that's that that description of the paper is, I gather, more or less correct. Um, they looked at uh, at immune responses in kids with or without cystic fibrosis who had or had not received the vaccine. So here's the here's the way I see this, and and this is this is interesting to me because it brings together a lot of things that that uh, were not I didn't understand before. Um, the idea is that when you get infected with influenza virus, you can get something called heterotypic immunity. Mm -hmm. And that is that you mount an immune response to other influenza strains that are not of the same like uh, uh, hemagglutinin subtype. And this involves immunity to conserve proteins like matrix protein and et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that requires cellular immunity, okay? And the way I take it is that those are proteins that are not necessarily exposed on the surface of the virus, you get immunity to those because they're processed into peptides, presented on the surface of the infected cells, and you get a cellular immune response to those. Mm -hmm. um, and the vaccine is a killed vaccine. And so you don't necessarily get a robust uh, a cellular immune response to that. Um, and so um, you don't, if you're repeatedly vaccinating kids with the inactivated vaccine, uh, you're not necessarily inducing, as you would with natural immunity, the same sort of heterotypic immunity. And, you know, so the vax basically it says the vaccine's not perfect. Okay. And I thought that was interesting. The thing is, it does protect you against the seasonal exactly. virus that you were. Right. It's not encounter. a reason not to vaccinate. No. No. Okay. I mean, and one of the flaws in this uh, site that she apparently found is that, you know, people will pick up papers like this and say, ah, vaccines are bad. Don't right, vaccinate. Right, yeah, right. Okay? right. right. Now, getting now, the virus is better for you than, than getting the vaccine, which is absolutely <laughs> wrong. No, all this, all this says is that, um, you know, you know, we could probably make a better vaccine. Maybe live, uh, live attenuated vaccines are better than this. This is better than nothing. Okay. But it's an issue that needs to be looked at. Yeah. I think that it would be interesting to do this study with the with the flu mist, the live attenuated Absolutely. vaccine, right? That, and I think they mention in the paper that, in fact, the live attenuated vaccine is better at stimulating a CD8 uh, response than is the in mm -hmm. inactivated vaccine. So are cystic fibrosis children more likely to succumb to influenza if they haven't been vaccinated rather than if they have been yeah, vaccinated? Yeah, so they're regularly... Vac yeah, vaccinated. exactly. Because they've got a lung disease to begin yeah. with. So they get the reason they pick them is because these kids sure. get flu vaccine year after oh, but year. But of course, right? but of course, right? But and they argue that this is okay to to use, but I don't think it is. I think you have to have you have to find the right population that aren't CF patients because uh, there I, could be I a think, complication, yeah. right? Yeah, I think this, exactly. this is a poorly chosen uh, set of cases and controls. I'll say. I mean, it was convenient for them because they say sure. in, in in the Netherlands they say we don't we don't routinely immunize kids every year against flu. So this was the only population they had. Right. So how far down does the CD8 count go? Is it dangerously low or is it just low? Well, they just show that it doesn't increase in, in the vaccinated kids as it does in, uh, in, so, co in control yeah, kids. This okay. is important to understand, it's, and, and it's a little uh, misstated in places. It's not as if the vaccination suppresses right. the CD8 T cell response. It's that the influenza-specific CD8 T cells that increase. you might ordinarily get yeah. don't increase got with it, that got vaccination. It, got it, got it, got it. I mean, right. So, so if, you, like, if you got the like, vaccine instead of the virus, yeah. you developed an antibody response. Right, right. If you got the virus instead of the vaccine, you're, going to, you're probably going to develop both an antibody and a CD8 response. Yeah. Right. I mean, see, Dixon, the graphs, first no, of all, the, the numbers are small, right. and there's right. a lot of scatter because even that's in the vaccinated children, there are some that make good CD8, right? right? So right. Right. I think this has to be done in more kids, more people in different populations. What's the and, N and better matched. This? What's the N? Um, you know, the, the dots here, each dot is a kid. So oh. 20, 30 kids. Oh, uh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Uh, so it's dangerous for the reasons that our listener is asking because you might at first face value think this means the vaccine isn't good, but there are right. flaws with this, but it's still, 
you should still get the vaccine because it will protect you against infection. Right. right. So this is this is a paper that you really shouldn't extrapolate <laughs> to clinical practice from. It's the type of paper that is um, it's looking around and saying, is there something int- potentially interesting that's worth studying? Because yeah. the study that we're all talking about is you, you ought to get uh, several thousand kids and group them into vaccinated and unvaccinated, and they ought to be you know, of similar health categories and then compare those. That's a very big, expensive study. Um, the, authors, the authors themselves mm. say in the discussion, by no means do we suggest halting annual vaccination of children, right. blah, 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 blah. Right. Right, right. right. So right. this is this is the paper to see if it even makes sense to do such a study. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they're saying, is there even a difference? Because uh, they they had originally um, sure. seen some inkling of this in a, in an animal model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they looked in people and they looked at a sample of convenience, small sample of convenience, and they said, okay, there's an inkling in people that there might be a similar phenomenon going on, at least in a few cases, spottily here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that means that it would probably be worth studying in more detail, and it means that it's something that um, you'd want to take into consideration for designing future vaccines. As we just Absolutely. said, a live attenuated vaccine might really be a way to, sure. to induce this better. Absolutely. Sure. So it's, a, it's a very preliminary, it's, it's important work, but it's not the kind of thing that should be interpreted in any clinical way. Right. Here, here. All right, let's move on to a couple of picks of the week. And I'm going to start with you, Dixon. Oh, good. I've got Fox News pick. <laughs> but it's not, a, it's not a Fox uh, News yeah. pick. Really? It's not a Fox News pick, but I found it by um, going through the archives of the Small World Contest sponsored by Nikon. And they have a nice website that you can go to, and I highly recommend that, but that's not my pick. My pick was because I'm attracted to things that swim in the water because I like fishing. Uh, I found uh, a portion of their website called What Are You Swimming With? And if you go to that uh, small section of their website, you will find some fascinating photo micrographs and uh, macro photographs of life forms that swim Hmm. and that are beautiful to look at and that are just reminiscent of the fact that life is beautiful and life is varied and life uh, exists in many places that we don't think about ordinarily. These yeah. really are beautiful. Those are my picks. That's my pick. Do you think- and, to, and to let you know that it is possible for Fox News to present relevant science. <laughs> That's right. This is their, you know, their community service uh- <laughs> demonstrating that it can be done. Hey, Dick Dixon, do you? That's right. Think that they are inherently beautiful, or because they're photographed beautifully? Both. Uh, I think they have fabulous symmetries uh, regardless of which symmetry you're looking at and the colors and the shapes and the sizes all remind us of the fact that we are related to all of those things I was just trying to trip you up now nah, you're you're not going to do that now no you can't trip this uh, you can, yes you can oh yes you can. <laughs> that's very possible to do but not in this not in this case Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, my pick is a gadget that probably a lot of people have already, but uh, <laughs> I got one of these for Christmas. Uh, the Amazon Kindle. Did you now? Yes, uh, and I got the, the Kindle Touch. Um, I specifically requested the one without special offers, which is ads. Uh, right. um, my wife got the one with the ads, and she doesn't. it's, it's <laughs> actually not that, not that big a difference, uh, except for 40 bucks in the price. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, one, the, the ads don't show up in the middle of a book or anything. They just, it's when you put the thing to sleep, the screensaver comes up, and on yeah. the one without ads, it's, it's just a nice uh, photograph, and uh, on the one with ads, it's an ad. So you've got a black and white book. <laughs> it's it's a black and white. Uh, so this thing, I, I I know there's also this uh, Amazon is doing some variant of it that's trying to be an iPad. Um, but what's cool about just the plain old Kindle or the Kindle Touch is it's a black and white uh, electronic ink screen. So instead of backlighting the display and putting it up with uh, the the way your computer display does it actually is moving ink around on the page and uh-huh. you look at it. It's not backlit. You need to use oh. a light to look at it, but you can read it in full sun. Like magnetic tape. It's just like a book. It's, it's just great. like a book. It's just like a book, except that it will store uh, tens of thousands of pages in, in this tiny little package. It doesn't get any heavier either, does it? It doesn't get any heavier when you load more files into it. I checked. What are you reading now? Uh, well, I... <laughs> 
At the moment, I'm actually reading uh, the Arabian Nights. Cool. Nice. Uh, and I'm also I'm also nice. um, rereading um, uh, Origin of Species. Oh. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Well, if I didn't have a iPad, I'd get one because they look cool. My daughter has one. She likes it a lot. And then there's the Kindle Fire, which is the upgrade to right. Color. That's that's the one that's trying to compete with the iPad. That's right. Kindle Fire is a way for Amazon to sell their stuff to you. This is all true. But I've I've tried reading on an iPad, and I found too, there was too much glare, especially if you do it in bright light. Yeah, yeah. Bright light is impossible. I've tried on the beach; it's just ridiculous. There's no special. Yeah, but they, screen the Kindle that looks beautifully in that. Yeah. In that. yeah. Oh, really? Really. Yeah, so I just stay inside. You know what? They're going to solve that problem. That's a minor glitch. They'll solve it. I'm sure. Because there must be some plastic that you can just fold over that will give you a, a matte finish. I'm sure it will come out. Don't worry, Dixon. Uh, I'm not. Then you can buy it when it's not ready. Not worried. That's right. Rich, what do you have for us? I'm back in movie mode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I want to uh, recommend a, a movie oh. called 12 Monkeys. <laughs> yes. Made in 1995, starring Bruce Willis. Oh no! Mavis, yes, it's a great movie. Madeline I Stowe totally agree. And Brad I, Pitt. No, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, this is just a wonderful movie. Oh, you're it's, right. it's weird, you know. <laughs> fasten your seatbelt. That's right. But it combines, you know, bioterrorism and time travel. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just uh, read the the bit uh, <laughs> from IMDb. In a future world devastated by disease, a convict is sent back in time to gather information about the man-made virus that wiped out most of the human population on the planet. I know. So, it was H5N1, right? Yes, <laughs> probably. Of course. It's because they published that paper. He, he went back to ferret out the results. Ooh. <laughs> hey, that's my job. Sorry, Alan. All right, now that you picked a movie, how about, look, Contagion is now available on Amazon and iTunes. Could we do it next time on Twib, do you think? Sure. Who, sure. Who's okay. left? I have to watch it. How about you, I have, Alan? I have to watch it. Can you see it online? Would that be possible? I should be able to do that. I haven't seen uh, it. It's not streaming, right? I mean, we'd have to get the disc, I think. Or is it streaming? You can oh, do either one. It's you can, I can get it on Amazon streaming. That would be... Yeah, it's on Amazon uh, Prime streaming. So one of our okay. listeners actually emailed and said, Hey, guys, <laughs> it's there. <laughs> so I will look at it this weekend. And uh, if you could do that. If you can't, Alan, that's fine. But uh, we'll do a discussion next time because we've got a bunch of emails sure. and be fun. Yes, right? looks like have I you can... Have you seen it, Dixon? I have not seen it yet. All right, see if you can... Uh, do you want me to buy you the disc so you can watch it? That's <laughs> nah, okay. I'll stream. You'll stream? I you like know how streams. to stream? I like streams. Okay. All right. My pick is a little experiment I'm doing over on my blog. And it's based on the following. And I you know, I have these email these searches done, as you heard earlier, Google searches of various sorts. And I click on various stories all throughout the day. And then they go away. And I thought, what if I could just save all of these with two clicks? So I, I've been reading the, the website of a man named Dave Weiner, and those of you listening may not know who he is. Some of you may, but he is the fellow who invented RSS, uh, real oh. simple syndication. He's called the father of blogging. He has a wonderful uh, blog at scripting.com. And he's int- always interested in how to control information. So I sent him an email, and he answered right away. I said, how do I save all these sites and make a stream of it? He said, oh, I've written the software for that. It's easy. <laughs> so he made me a count on his server and gave me the software. And basically, I put a little button in my browser, a link. And when I find a story, I just click on it and save it to a stream. And that stream I can put anywhere. So it's at virology.ws slash news. And whenever I come across a news item that I think is interesting, I put it there. Mm. So you can go to virology.com slash news, or it's in the sidebar of the blog as well. It's, kind of, it's an experiment just to see uh, how this stream works. And, and Dave said what you can do is you can take little streams and make rivers out of them. Oh. You could then consolidate streams into it, and he has the software for that. So he said, when you're ready for that, I'll give you that too. So Can you get an ocean of information? Then you can get an ocean and a universe, <laughs> yes. absolutely. That's right. So anyway, check that out and... Um, you can do it yourself because his the software is available on his site, and if you're interested, you could check it out. But it's pretty cool. So I have now this thing uh, called Microbe News, which is just basically a link blog. Really, it's a blog of links. Sure, sure. And every day I see a cool story. So today I I bookmarked from the jungle to JFK viruses cross borders and monkey meat. 
from the New York Times. And yesterday for the Times of India, India on vigil for a new enemy because that's the other thing to mention. Mm-hmm. Today is one year in India without polio. Really? Wow. Excellent. Which is amazing. Yeah. Because po- India was one of the harder nations to, to get rid of the disease from. So mm-hmm. that is my pick. Great. Cool. All right. We have two listener picks, one from Eric. Hello, professors. Thanks again for all the effort and care you invest into your podcasts. I'm writing today to suggest a pick of the week, The Nature of Things, with David Suzuki. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Suzuki, one of Canada's scientists slash rock stars, hosts this weekly science program on our public broadcaster. The Nature of Things takes complex and topical ideas in science and presents them in an accessible informative and entertaining way, much like yourselves. In particular, I would like to recommend an episode from December 8th, 2011 on the potential role of the gut microbiome in autism. The hypotheses discussed in this show are still largely at the bench, but they are interesting and touch on some of the themes you've discussed on TWIM. I hope this link will work for your American audience. Episodes are also available in iTunes. Thanks from Guelph. Partly cloudy, unseasonable, <laughs> four degrees Celsius, <laughs> proper fridge temperature, Eric. A. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Eric. And Lance writes, Wired Online recently published a great article on why science, specifically focused on biomedical and pharmaceutical, has been failing and the philosophy behind causality and how we as scientists are led astray by our own assumptions. Some really interesting work dealing with the philosophy of science. Thanks, and keep up the great work. It's called Trials and Errors, Why Science is Failing Us by Jonah Lehrer. Interesting article. Wired. Yes. It is, it is really although the, the headline is extreme. Yes, mm. it's not really failing. Science is not failing us. Look no. at the uh. papers we discussed today. <laughs> hey, that is not failing science. No, no, no. All right, that'll do it for TWIV 166. You know you can find us on iTunes and at twiv.tv. We do we would like you to subscribe in iTunes and leave a comment there if you haven't done so already. It helps us stay visible so that more people find us. And you can send your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Dixon, wake up. I'm up. I didn't go to sleep. I'm just giving you a hard time. I'm just sitting over here enjoying the uh, feeling of having participated in another wonderful show. <laughs> Dixon, where can people find you? Uh, several places, actually. MedicalEcology.org, Trichinella.org, and VerticalFarm.com. Thank you for joining us, Dixon. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Alan Dove, where can people find you? They can find me at AlanDove.com. Excellent. Thank you for joining us as well. Always a pleasure. And Rich Condit, where can people find you? <laughs> they can on the find beach. me at the University of Florida in Gainesville. You know, I'm not all that public. Now, right? You know, you you do have a Pox website, right? I do. Uh, well, well, I've got a page, a faculty page. No, no, know? there's that one with the virus picture. Oh, that's yeah, cool. that's right, the model. What is that's that called? Vacciniamodel.com. Nice. Vacciniamodel.com. That's it. Rich has uh, pictures of his favorite things there. Right. That's true. Thank you, Rich. You're quite welcome. Always a good time. Very good. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I can be found at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>